My name is Sherni Boteach, and I am in a unique position to welcome all of you on behalf of both This World, the Jewish Values Network, who organized this evening's event, as well as Yeshiva University, who so graciously is hosting it. I am a third year undergraduate at Yeshiva University's Stern College for Women, where I'm an English major. I have two sisters and a brother who have likewise been students at Yeshiva, an outstanding educational institution that uniquely synthesizes the glory, wisdom, and beauty of the Jewish tradition with modern academics. I'm also the daughter of the founder and executive director of This World, the Jewish Values Network, Rabbi Shmuley Boteach, affectionately known throughout the world as America's rabbi. Rabbi Shmuley has been labeled by Newsweek and the Washington Post as the most famous rabbi in America. The New York Observer calls him the most famous Orthodox Jew in the world. And the Jerusalem Post lists him as one of the, 50, the world's 50 most influential, influential Jewish figures. In 1988, the Lubavitch Rebbe sent my parents to Oxford University in England to serve as his personal emissaries. And my father served as rabbi to the students for 11 years, where he created the Oxford University, University L'Chaim Society, which developed a unique approach to Jewish activism, which has been widely emulated on campuses throughout the world. Rather than merely creating a haven for Jewish students, Rabbi Shmuley sought to make Oxford itself into a place that was permeated with Jewish ideas and values. The Chaim Society quickly grew to become the second largest student organization in Oxford's history, and some of its students and presidents and officers have made their mark on the world already. Cory Booker, who served as the president of L'Chaim in 1993, was just elected senator of New Jersey. Ron Dermer, who served as the president of L'Chaim in 1995, has just become Israel's ambassador to the United States. And Eric Garcetti, a student officer in 94, was just elected the new mayor of Los Angeles. When my father returned to the United States, after 11 years at Oxford, he started This World, the Jewish Values Network to take the message to a much broader audience and to influence American culture and media with the light of Jewish values. The event you are seeing tonight is part of a regular series staged by the Jewish Values Network, where we bring captains of industry, leaders in politics, the world's foremost media commentators, and heads of state to discuss the pressing values issues of our time. Just last month, we hosted an event on genocide at Cooper Union that attracted thousands of people and featured Nobel Peace Laureate Elie Wiesel and Rwandan President Paul, P Paul Kagame. Tonight, we are so honored to be joined by three global leaders in the fields of finance, philanthropy, written, com written commentary, and education. Here to introduce them is my father and the moderator of tonight's event, Rabbi Shmuley Boteach. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Is my microphone working? It is, okay. It's a, it's, a, it's a great pleasure to be here. Uh, this event was brought together in a single week and to see such a large turnout uh, in so sh short a space of time, I think is a testimonial to how important tonight's subject is. Full page ad of the New York Times on page A9, other ads that appeared and you responded to the, to the challenge, the question of will Jews exist? with an existential threat against the state of Israel in the form of Iran and a nuclear weapon being developed, whether it's a uranium weapon, a plutonium weapon, and with assimilation being so rampant in the United States and with that devastating, catastrophic Pew Research poll that just came out that seemed to indicate that with the exception of the Orthodox community, American Jewry are slowly disappearing. 70% have no affiliation with the Jewish community or a synagogue affiliation. They prefer to go to the dentist chair than sit and hear a rabbi sermon. 30% light a Christmas tree. That one really surprised me because the one area where secular Jews always identified themselves is that we're not Christian, we're Jews. But even that seems to be disappearing with, with more than a third believing that a faith in Jesus Christ is compatible with Judaism. 
58% of American Jews are marrying outside of the community. 78% of the non-Orthodox marrying outside the community. So these are very, very frightening numbers, and we wanted to quickly call a public forum on them. And tonight, ladies and gentlemen, you are all privileged to host and to hear the leaders in their fields, respectively. And I will now introduce them. First and foremost, I want to thank my daughter Sterney for that beautiful introduction. She is an undergraduate here, so we thought it would be a good idea for her to... <laughs> First and foremost, ladies and gentlemen, the number one philanthropist, Jewish philanthropist in the entire world, and one of the foremost Jewish philanthropists of all time, a man who together with his wife, Dr. Miriam, is reshaping the Jewish people as we know it, a man who is largely responsible for taking close to 400,000 young Jews to Israel for their first time on a free trip discovering the Jewish homeland, a man more responsible for Holocaust memory than any, uh, any other person alive, a couple who devote hundreds of millions of dollars to medical research the world over, and a couple whose very name has become synonymous, synonymous with Jewish identity, support for the state of Israel, and Jewish pride, one of the world's most successful businessmen in all of human history, Mr. Sheldon Adelson. That's the man sitting to my left. <laughs> to my right, uh, my very dear friend, who served as my editor at the Jerusalem Post uh, when he was just 28 years old. Shel um, Brett was a 28-year-old editor of the Jerusalem Post, one of the world's marquee publications. Um, I was one of his writers. <laughs> From there, he went to become the foreign affairs columnist for the Wall Street Journal, which he currently is, as well as deputy editorial page editor of the Wall Street Journal. And for those of us who know and love Brett and who have been his friends uh, for many years, we were so proud when in 2013, just a few months back, he won the Pulitzer Prize for commentary. Ladies and gentlemen, Brett Stevens. You, should just leave. You, should just leave. you know, I should mention that Brett kind of stole my Pulitzer, but what's a Pulitzer between friends? I consider it, uh, I consider it an, a buried issue, Brett. We can just move on. And, and finally, we're here at Yeshiva University, to whom I have a personal debt of gratitude, because uh, of our nine children, the four oldest were already educated at Yeshiva University. Our daughter Mushki graduated with a BA in communication. She's now a writer. Uh, our daughter Chana was at Stern College for Women. She now served in the IDF in the Israeli army and just graduated from the IDF after two years of service. We're very proud of her service, thank God. Our, <laughs> our son Mendy went to the high school here and graduated and he just got smicha from the Chabad Seminary in Pretoria, South Africa. <laughs> and our daughter Sterney, as you heard, is an undergraduate at Shreve University Stern College for Women. So I am someone who truly believes in this institution. It's the world's foremost Jewish Academy of Learning anywhere. Uh, its, its reputation is legendary. But before... Your, the man tuition, uh, your tuition is due. Is, I know, it's behind. Why do you think we're doing this event tonight, Richard? Wake up, wake up. <laughs> if you don't shed a couple of shekels after tonight, man, then I don't know if we even have a, a, a relationship. But before Richard Joel became the president of Yeshiva University, he was the international head of Hillel. He is widely credited with having revolutionized Hillel and, and revamped its, its programming. He instilled Jewish pride. Uh, his whole program of getting kids just to do Jewish became uh, something legendary on campuses. And uh, it was largely because of his phenomenal success heading Hillel's across the nation that he was chosen to become the fourth president of Yeshiva University. Ladies and gentlemen, our host this evening, Dr. Richard Joel. Thank you. Okay, this is meant to be an intimate conversation. Because of how important this subject is, existential threat uh, facing the Jewish people physically from Iran and other terrorist threats against Israel and the, and the existential threat of assimilation, I'm asking the speakers to be very candid. There are, there's a lot of press here, 
There's friendly press. There's press that may not be as friendly. We want this to be an open forum. They're all here, and the public is here, but we're going to have a, a dialogue which is candid and honest, that is not tailored to suit any particular audience. Uh, I have no intention, I should say, of being um, an impartial uh, moderator. I, I, people read my columns, they know that I have strong views on certain subjects, and I hope to challenge all the people on this panel because of really? how important the subject Yes, you will discover that, Sheldon. <laughs> okay, so you have to be ready. So let me be immediately begin with you, Brett. You are are recognized by many as one of the foremost defenders of Israel in the English language. Some consider you to be the best current defender of Israel in the English language uh, from a very important perch of the Wall Street Journal. Um, I'm better in Spanish. <laughs> well, you were raised in Mexico City. Um, you wrote, but you recently wrote a column that, that upset a lot of people. You said that Ehud Olmert should really be the Prime Minister of Israel right now, not Benjamin Netanyahu, because Netanyahu, you said, was all hat and no cattle. He talks a big talk. You predicted that he would go to the UN and say yet again, I'm laying down a line. We're going to attack Iran. We may have to act alone. You said Olmert actually did it with serious nucle uh, nuclear facilities. The next morning, the Prime Minister of Israel saw you, kind of joked with you a little bit about it. But uh, were you serious about the article? Do you really think that Benjamin Netanyahu is not ready to strike Iran amidst this existential threat that they pose to Israel's uh, continuity? Um, well, look, uh, I hope for the best, uh, which is um, to say that I hope that he uh, means what he says and uh, is prepared to act if he needs to. I fear that Israel has walked itself into a corner by spending too much time trying to placate the United States rather than look after its security interests. Um, there are few speakers in Israel's history who are more convincing and compelling uh, than Benjamin Netanyahu, but if you look at his record, he's a very cautious and often very tactical politician. And I fear that the record of his, I guess now he's in his third term, but really the last uh, four years, is that a lot of energy has been spent trying to get right with the Obama administration on the theory that the Obama administration and or President Obama meant what he said when he told Jeffrey Goldberg, the uh, journalist last year, that I, as the President of the United States, do not bluff, I will not allow Iran to get nuclear weapons. Well, ladies and gentlemen, if you've been following what's happening in Syria or vis-a-vis uh, -vis Syria in the last two months, you know perfectly well that this president does bluff, and that the state of Israel should be... <laughs> should be thinking very carefully about how credible, how credible U.S. assurances are. Let me put it to you in, a, in another way. If you've been following the news, and if you looked at the front page of the Wall Street Journal, one of the most interesting stories is to see the despair that our dear friends, the Saudis, have um, when it comes to Obama's seriousness uh, with uh, arming the moderate opposition, hopefully semi-moderate opposition, comparatively moderate opposition, uh, 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 in, in uh, fighting the Assad regime in Syria. In May or June, I was on a conference call with uh, Deputy National Security Advisor Benjamin Rhodes when he talked about how the administration was now committed to moving materiel to these rebels. Well, months later, it turns out they haven't moved anything, or they've moved uh, de minimis uh, amounts of equipment. So the Saudis are despairing of the credibility of American security guarantees. The Poles and the Czechs despaired of the credibility of those guarantees when the Obama administration pulled the carpet out from under them uh, in 2009 on, on ballistic uh, missile defense. This is a regime, or this is a, I should say, this is an administration uh, that, uh, that, that was honestly, I don't mean to say a regime. I, 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 I do not consider this a regime. This is an administration. So that, was, that was not a Freudian slip. It might have been Freudian, but I'm unaware of it. Um, uh, this is an administration that goes out of its way to appease its enemies and uh, does not think carefully about the harm it's doing to traditional American friendships and alliances around the world. So to get back to your question, the government of Israel, whatever your appraisal is of Benjamin Netanyahu's character or his fortitude, the government of Israel has to be seized with the fact that no more important issue confronts it than the prospect, an imminent prospect, of a nuclear Iran. 
that the consequences of an Israeli military strike might be serious for Israel and no military strike in history has taken place without some forms of unintended consequences. But the perfectly foreseeable consequences of an Iran with nuclear weapons is a catastrophe for the state of Israel and by the way, a catastrophe for the United States as well. And that is what we need to think about. You know, more than once so in so, history, so you, were you one, one last him? point, one we, last point. More than, more than once in, in, uh, in the last 60 years, it has been Israel that has saved the United States from foreign policy disasters, and Americans ought to recognize that. In 1981, against the, against the objections of the Reagan administration, Israel did what had to be done to stop Iraq from gaining a nuclear weapon. And it was only 10 years later that then Defense Secretary Dick Cheney recognized what a contribution that Israel, uh, Israel made to Western security then. We're coming up on that moment now. Was I trying to goad Bibi Netanyahu? Yes, I that's, was, that's and I succeeded. Ask. Okay, so that's why you wrote the column. You wrote the column because you were trying to push the Prime Minister to, to strike? I was trying to push the Prime Minister to understand that, no, that the State of Israel does not exist, does not exist to ask the government of the United States for permission to do what's in its core national security <laughs> Brett Stevens, that is quite a statement, my gosh. I'm okay. pro-Israel. <laughs> Sheldon, you're very close to the Prime Minister. Um, Brett is saying that he doesn't have the guts to attack if, 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 if need be. Uh, do you agree? I think he said that in the article, but he didn't say that just now. That's right. He said he wanted to goad Bibi into taking strong action. Uh, first of all, um, I was going to say about the, the basic question, ditto. But there were some things he said, so I got to say mostly ditto. Uh, for, uh, again, not first of all, again, whatever I say, it applies to my wife and I. Because we're always together. Uh, yes, he has seen BB, she has seen BB separately, I've seen BB separately. And the same with Omer. Uh, as a matter of fact, I think Mary and I know Omer longer than we know Bibi. By just a couple of months. Um, he was then uh, Minister of Health. Uh, and we, Mary was trying, my wife was trying to set up a, a drug abuse treatment and research center, which she ultimately did. And knowing both men, I could tip, my conclusion is very simple. Omer is a political person. He will, his wind blows in the direction of the polls. Bibi is not a political person. Bibi's wind blows in the direction of his ideology and his deep and unwavering support and love for the Jewish people in the state of Israel. I am absolutely convinced that B.B. says what he mean, means, what he says, and if he says that Iran is an existential threat, he would not live, not even as just prime minister, he would not live, face these issues without taking some kind of action. Okay, so you believe that he's absolutely ready to act on his own if the United States does not act, and if these new negotiations do not bear any kind of fruit, don't lead to any kind of progress. Under the threat of harm or damage to the Jewish people in the state of Israel, he, in my opinion, you must understand, I've never, purposely never discussed it with him. I don't want to discuss it with him. I don't want to know. I don't want him to tell me or say I can't tell you. So I've never discussed it with him. But knowing him as well as we do, I'd say if it involves the security and the safety, of the Jewish people worldwide, not only just in Israel, and the state of Israel, he'd be prepared to walk in his head from Israel to the United States and back. He will do whatever it takes. So Brett's column was wrong? Completely. Okay. Ooh. <laughs> Maybe not completely, 98%. <laughs> 
Okay, Brett. Well, you heard not that first. we don't think not that we don't think that Omer is not a patriot. He, he is a patriot, but his patriotism extends sort of modified by the political considerations. Okay, um, I want to stay in Iran. I was amazed by this story today. This is from NBC News um, a few hours ago. When I was the rabbi at Oxford, there was a very nice student uh, from Saudi Arabia, a Saudi Arabian prince named Prince Khaled ibn Bandar. His father at the time was a Saudi ambassador to the United States. Uh, he came to a few of our events, uh, Friday night dinners. Uh, he heard uh, Holocaust speakers. His father is now the intelligence chief of Saudi Arabia. And he said today that Saudi Arabia was moving away, quote, making a major shift in relations with the United States in protest at the negotiations with Iran. Now that's astonishing. Saudi Arabia is going to distance itself from the United States because they're angry that America is speaking to Iran. So uh, again, Brett, to you. Is President Rouhani, is he telling the truth that he's more of a moderate? Is he a liar, as, pre as, as the Prime Minister said he is? at the UN, that he's a, he's a wolf in sheep's clothing. And is Iran, just straight out, is Iran intent on attacking Israel? Are they an absolute existential threat? And there's no way to negotiate, to negotiate away from it. That this regime is militant, it has jihad on its mind, and Israel is its foremost target. Um, look, something that... Uh, in most conversations about nuclear weapons isn't sufficiently understood is, is the following. With nuclear weapons, possession is use. People say, oh, the Iranians would never be so crazy as to try to attack Israel with nuclear weapons because they know that Israel has the capability for devastating reprisal. I'm not so sure about that calculation, and I could go into that later. But when you have a nuclear weapon, you can do things as a country that countries that don't have nuclear weapons uh, cannot, okay? North Korea is this impoverished, famished regime, but they have our attention because they have nuclear weapons. Pakistan is a country that has produced almost nothing in its entire history except in a, in a, its most distinguished citizens always manage to leave the country, which is an interesting subject unto itself, but they have nuclear weapons, so they have our attention. They are, they are important in the way that uh, uh, a Kyrgyzstan or Turkmenistan is simply not. If Turkmenistan got nuclear weapons, believe me, we'd all become Turkmenistan experts. So the idea that Iran gets a nuclear weapon means that it believes that it's invulnerable to attack, to regime change, that it can activate its allies in Hezbollah and Hamas against Israel in the way that it cannot now, that it can potentially strike Jewish targets around the world even more aggressively than it, uh, than it does now. Think about it. This is a country that was prepared to blow up a restaurant in Washington, D.C. without the benefit of a nuclear umbrella. What would it be prepared to do if it had a nuclear umbrella, just how much more aggressive would it be? So this kind of idiot thing that you hear among supposedly sophisticated people, oh, Israel has the means of reprisal, et cetera, et cetera, is a foolish way of thinking. Now with Rouhani, here's the question. Bibi says he's a wolf in sheep's clothing, right? Maybe, or maybe he's a sheep among wolves. It doesn't really matter, because the, what matters in Iran is not President Rouhani. It is the supreme leader, the Ayatollah Ali Khamenei, and the Iranian Revolutionary Guards Corps, and the extremist mullahs who are around them. They are the center of political gravity for the time being. Now, no one should, for one second, confuse them with the vast majority of Iranians who would be delighted to get rid of this obnoxious, awful, repressive regime. And those are the people that we should find ways to support, by the way. When people say, oh, you know, all you want to do is, you know, bomb Iran, et cetera, et cetera. No, excuse me. I'm on the side of the people of Iran, and the people who want to appease the regime are on the side of the oppressors of the, uh, of, of the people of Iran. But in terms of the way we understand Iranian politics, we shouldn't be asking ourselves questions about Rouhani's psychology. We should be analyzing the actual political reality of a regime which has been under the sway of the supreme leader. You know, they don't call you supreme leader if you're the semi-supreme leader. Uh, 
you know, if you're the if you're the supreme kind leader of. in name only, it's not like a, a university president where you really have no control. <laughs> <laughs> he is he is the dictator of this country, above all on the nuclear portfolio. So this fascin turn off his microphone. <laughs> <laughs> this fascination with Rouhani is a sign of our own political and strategic short-sightedness. You know, when Rouhani is supreme leader, and that day will probably never happen, then we can have a conversation about whether he's a Gorbachev or not. Right now, he's a Kosygin, and there's a Brezhnev above him, if some of you get this analogy, uh, and Brezhnev is the bad guy. You're just trying to point out how old some of us are here. I, I, I get it, because <laughs> I got the analogy. Um, Sheldon, turning to you again, um, Brett is very passionate about this, believes Iran is a true threat. His columns reflect that. His comments tonight, which are very forceful, reflect that. Now, you have a, a bully pulpit to the world because you spend a lot of money on politics, you spend a lot of money on philanthropy, and you're a very prominent businessman. Um, you spoke at an event in, in Las Vegas where I heard you say that you were very disappointed in the actions of Franklin Delano Roosevelt and not doing enough to prevent the Holocaust. Uh, he won the war, but he could have done more, and, and historians, uh, many historians agree he, with you. He could have prevented the Holocaust. You believe he could have prevented the Holocaust? Yes. How could he have prevented if the Holocaust? Not, if not have prevented the Holocaust, he could have at least uh, significantly uh, reduced the severity of the Holocaust by not persuading the Brits, when he had the leverage, unlimited leverage over the UK, to open the door to Palestine. They, all he had to do was convince them that it was more important for them and their future by saying, look, one day the America will become less isolationist and you're gonna turn to me and ask me to join the war, which you're already doing, but I can't do it now because Americans are far too isolationist. Um, it'll be easy for me if you take the step of uh, being humanitarian, and not keeping, the, not closing the door to the state of it, to the state of Palestine, that time. So just don't sign the white paper, which limited, which limited the, the Jewish immigration to uh, immigration Thailand. to Palestine, at first to fifty thousand forever over a five-year period, and uh, it it was subsequently changed to seventy-five thousand. So it was fifteen thousand a year for five years forever. Now, had he made that phone call, I don't know what the result could have been, but I suspect, having negotiated for 68 years in business, that he really had the leverage, he really had the upper hand, and that he could have convinced uh, Chamberlain, or whoever was the prime minister at the time, don't sign the white paper. By the way, it's not only him, it was a democratic administration. Okay. But uh, I know there's a lot of Democrats in here. <laughs> and I want to tell you something you probably don't know. I'm a Republican. <laughs> <laughs> well, I just For, learned something formerly new. Formerly a Democrat because I didn't know better. <laughs> well, I just learned something new that you're a Republican, Sheldon. But let's be fair, the, but let's be fair. And we'll do another event about this because I want to delve more deeply into it. But at the time, the Republican Party was even more isolationist than the Democrats. They really didn't want any kind of foreign intervention. And parties sometimes change when it comes to what they believe should be, what we saw the Republican Party support the war in Iraq. And now we saw a lot of Republicans who were even opposed to a strike against, uh, against uh, Syria after the gassing of children. But be that as it may, given your strong feelings about what the United States did not do to prevent the Holocaust, the Holocaust, what are your feelings about President Obama outside of political, I'm not asking this as a political question or the fact that you uh, supported candidates who opposed him. What is your feeling about Obama speaking to Iran right now and having diplomatic relations with Iran, picking up the phone to President Rouhani, while Iran still has yet to repudiate the genocidal statements of his predecessor, Mahmoud Ahmadinejad, um, Ayatollah Ali Khamenei has yet to repudiate his own genocidal statements about Israel. As recently as this March, he said he would wipe Haifa and Tel Aviv off the map. Last November, he said that Israel is a scab that must be, must be uh, removed. What are your feelings about the United States, just as an American, as a prominent American, speaking to Iran while those threats still exist? The worst negoti negotiating tactic I could ever imagine in my entire life. Why is that? 
because you can't get anything from him. He's not saying to them, roll back your entire program and show that you're willing to be peaceful. So roll it all back if that's what you're going to end up with. We'll roll back, we'll roll back the sanctions. So what is it, a game of chicken? Who's going who's gonna to blink first? It's very simple. It's the same thing with the Palestinians. 65 years, they haven't taken one millimeter step toward the Israelis to accommodate the needs of the Israelis, but more importantly, to show they truly want peace. I mean, if they truly want peace, if they truly want peace, it's very simple to say to all their henchmen, uh, lay off the terrorism for five years. And they'll come to the Jews and say, for five or ten years, there'll be no terrorism, there'll be no violence or no incitement against. We'll throw out the books to teach the three-year-old children that Jews are, are, are descended from uh, swine and apes and that we're not going to teach anymore to, with, with the, the, in their curriculum uh, to kill the Jews, that the Jews are very bad people. So if you want, if you really want peace, it's very simple to send the message to your opposition. Just be peaceful. Open, open up all the things that said, oh, we'll give you this if you give us something. I think it's the worst negotiating ploy tactic anybody could imagine. Right, so you would support negotiations with Iran currently so long as they first seized all enrichment of uranium? No. What do you mean support negotiations? What are we going to negotiate about? You what see, I would say is, listen, you see that desert out there? I want to show you something. So you pick up your cell phone, even at, uh, even at uh, traveling rates. You pick up your cell phone, and what are they called? Roaming charges. Roaming charges. <laughs> uh, you pick up your cell phone, and you call somewhere in Nebraska, and you say, okay, let it go. So there's an atomic weapon goes over ballistic missiles in the middle of the, middle of the desert that doesn't hurt a soul. Maybe a couple of rattlesnakes and scorpions or whatever. And then you, and then you say, see, the next one is in the middle of Tehran. So we mean business. You want to be wiped out? Go ahead and take a tough position and continue with your nuclear development. You want to be peaceful? You want to be peaceful? Just reverse it all, and we will guarantee you that you can have a, a, a nuclear power plant for electricity purposes, for energy purposes. That's all. There's well, no, there's no so a deal. tremendous demonstration and of American strength, so that they would get the, the message. The only that thing they understand. And do you see the current negotiations as a demonstration of weakness? Absolutely. Unquestionably. It's, it's interesting that... If, uh, if I, I'm sorry, excuse me, but... If I were on the other side, I'd say it's nothing but weakness. Everything that we've said about it, we want to wipe Israel off the map. Blah, 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 blah. It, by the way, it's a religious issue. You know, Ahmedinejad, Ahmedinejad believed that as a, as a Muslim, and I don't know the difference between the Shia and the Sunnis, that there is something called the, the hidden imam who's supposed to be their messiah, or the 12th imam, he's alternately called. So he believes if he comes, and I think you're gonna kill all the Jews first before the hidden imam shows up. That's their belief. And um, so he wants to kill all the Jews, so he'll be the man responsible for bringing back the hidden imam. So it's a religious issue, at least in his mind. He was a radical. He was part of the people that, in 1979, the Iranian group who, who took the hostages out of the U.S. Embassy. And, I mean, he's just a, a plain embedded radical. So I wouldn't trust him as, I wouldn't trust him, not as far as I could throw him, just wouldn't trust him at all under any circumstances. Well, I was just gonna say that the advice that... Um... First of all, is that, do you agree with what Sheldon said? 98 <laughs> percent. Is this, is this payback for what he said about your column? I don't know, your interpretation. In 1986, Rouhani was caught on tape offering advice to a person he believed was a, 
U.S. administration official, but turned out to be uh, an Israeli agent, on how to negotiate with Iran. And he said, you guys want your hostages freed? He was talking about the American hostages in Lebanon. You need to show strength. You need to show that you're prepared to take military action and you'll get your hostages free. The whole purpose of Rouhani's speech to, uh, uh, to uh, this Israeli agent was to say, Khomeini only answers to demonstrations of strength. What do we know about the Iranian nuclear program? We know that there was one year in which they suspended their program. Miraculously, that year was 2003, when a large American army of 150,000 troops drove all the way to Baghdad and made it, it appeared that the United States was very serious about dealing with rogue regimes that it believed had weapons of mass destruction. That was the one year in which they suspended their uh, nuclear program. I want to make just one ancillary point that in a sense touches on what you've just said, but it's important because I suspect there are people here who want to paint what's going on on the stage as this demonstration of insane right-wing craziness, you know, you want to bomb Iran, you're warmongers, et cetera, okay? I want these people, whoever you are in the audience, to think of this. A regime that is capable of taking a stone in one hand and stoning a woman to death a regime that hangs gay people from cranes in the streets of Tehran should not, under any circumstances, get anywhere near a nuclear bomb so they can do likewise to other people. The people who keep saying we need to conciliate with Iran, we need to find a modus vivendi with them, we need to meet them halfway, okay, are objectively fellow traveling with one of the most repressive regimes in the world today. And by the way, when you ask about Rouhani, whatever he is now, he's a moderate, he's not such a moderate, he has been a fellow traveler, in fact, a senior member of a regime that has done more harm and caused more mayhem to its own pe with its own people and to other people, not the least of whom are Jews, for 34 years. So people who go out and say, oh, those crazy right-wingers are warmongers against Iran, okay, we need to find peace with Iran. You're finding peace with a regime that is the number one repressor of women, of gay people, of religious minorities, of Jews, and so on. If you call yourself a liberal under those circumstances, you need to re-examine what your liberalism is all about. Oh. Brett, I now want you to tell us what you really think about Iran. <laughs> I haven't started. I don't want you, I, I, I feel you're holding back a little bit and you told me you would not do that tonight. You said that you would speak candidly. Um, and by the way, it's not just uh, all the groups that you just mentioned, it's the Iranian people themselves. They're the ones yeah, that, were, that were murdered in the above streets all. in the summer of 2009 when they simply wanted to demonstrate peacefully against Ahmadinejad and they were slaughtered before the eyes of the world. It took our government a week to even condemn those murders that were tw tweeted and sent on Facebook throughout the world. Okay, we've talked about the existential threat, we will, we will return to it, but there's two threats facing the Jewish people, as we mentioned. One, of course, is the the threat from Iran, which the world is somewhat focused on, uh, maybe not enough. I'm very uh, grateful to you, Brett, for, for writing today in the Wall Street Journal about all the innocent, our innocent Arab brothers and sisters who are being murdered in the streets of Iraq daily, suicide bombings of 7,500 by Al-Qaeda that no one even cares about, and there's no mention of it, and you were the first to really talk about it just today, and that shows your commitment to human life, and I, and I salute you. Um, but the spiritual threat can lead to the same kind of devastation. Um, we in the United States, we American Jews, don't seem to need a Rouhani bomb to uh, devastate us. We seem to be doing a very fine job of it ourselves, thank you very much. Uh, the Pew Research study that I just <laughs> cited was absolutely devastating. It was really the saddest thing that I had ever read about American Jewry. I, I couldn't believe the numbers. The, the disinterest uh, about being Jewish, the lack of Jewish pride, the lack of connection to the state of Israel. Yes, birthright is changing these things, Sheldon, but really the numbers were, 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 were catastrophic. That 70% of Jews just have no affiliation with anything Jewish, 70%. Um, intermarriage rates that are, just, that are just skyrocketing. 
Um, Richard, it begins on the university campuses. These are becoming seabeds of assimilation. I was the rabbi at Oxford University for 11 years. You ran Worldwide Hillel. Now you're the president of, of, uh, of Yeshiva University. So I want to ask you a two-part question. First and foremost, with everything that we just heard, that Iran oppresses all these people, as, as Brett just said, and, and Israel's enemies are not committed to the same rights that Israel is committed to. The rights of women, full rights of education, um, the rights of gays. Uh, who are so often murdered under Hamas under uh, the false allegations of being uh, of collaborating with Israel, etc. Why is Israel's reputation on campus, especially, so absolutely awful? It's incredible how bad it is. I mean, I fought these battles at Oxford for years. We brought Netanyahu twice, Sharon, Perez, Rabin, everyone to fight these battles, and I saw it beginning to start in 1988. By the time you were running Hillel, it was the whole camp. It was a, it was a movement called BDS, no. which is only growing. Not when I was a hillo. Okay. So it wasn't your fault. <laughs> well, it's all my fault. I'm the president of, of the university. It's a... Okay. First and foremost, why is Israel's reputation so bad on campuses? Well, I wouldn't just challenge what you started with by saying that the problem with assimilation really starts on campus. The problem with assimilation starts in the home. Jews are not being... We can talk about campus, and I'll be happy to talk to you about campus. But the basic issue is that this is the first generation in which being Jewish is an option and not a condition. And if it's an option, not a condition, why should young Jews exercise the option? They don't have the memory of Bubba and Zayda. Right? They don't have the neighborhoods they're living in. They don't have a sense of passion from the home. So if they're not educated, if they're not in a community, if they're not experiencing Jewish passion, then what are they supposed to be excited about? The issue is way before campus. Campus can be used, even birthright. We didn't look as a, what we'd say in Hebrew, lechatchila, an a priori uh, thing. It's a last gasp. And from my perspective, I felt that any kind of hasbara you would do on campus for the majority of Jews who don't have a context to connect with Israel would be wasted, and the only thing that would work is birthright. The only thing that would work is birthright, not because Israel's magic, but because a trip to the Jewish homeland gives a young, disconnected Jew permission to own his or her Jewish story. And it begins them on a trip. But I really need to say that shame on all of us that we take a 4,000-year story that has defined Western civilization and are neglecting it to death. It's not the campus, it's the home, it's the failure to invest in education, it's the failure to invest in Jewish community, it's the failure of people to know any Jewish values except the 10 suggestions. <laughs> okay, now, gonna, what was it you wanted to know? No, I'm gonna, I'm gonna... I was trying to be more passionate about that than Brett was about Iran. <laughs> Stronger words to follow? Stronger words to follow. Well, let me challenge you on that, Richard. I'm not sure you're right. Um, Turn and off please, please. <laughs> and please don't increase my, please don't increase my kids' tuition, please. I got nine children, thank God. No, I'm not sure you're right. Let me put... It's our only in, hope. Well, let me, let me... Let me put this to you. I think that... Tons of money has been spent on Jewish education and, and Jewish outreach, maybe billions of dollars. And the devastating thing about the numbers was that it doesn't seem to have made much of an impact. Look, the Lubavitcher Rebbe started Jewish outreach in 1967. It was copied by every Jewish movement. You can't be a rabbi in a synagogue today unless you do outreach. So we're all doing outreach, not enough. We should always be doing more, I agree. But 58% intermarriage, 70% non-affiliated. What if I were to say to you the problem is not the investment but our model, our model is, let's create Hillel and make it better on campus. Let's have better food, let's have better speakers, so that the Jewish kids will choose to be at Hillel on Friday night, or on Hillel on a Wednesday night, and not in the mainstream. They're always going to want to be mainstream. They want to hang out with their non-Jewish friends. They're at Penn, they're at, they're at Harvard, they're at the University of USC. What we need to do is stop the model of creating more Jewish bastions and bring Judaism to them. We have to create Jewish television shows on mainstream channels. We need more writers like Brett Stevens who write about Jewish themes, not exclusively, he won a Pulitzer, but he writes about Israel. We need, to, we need to bring Judaism to the mainstream instead of investing more and creating more of a Jewish community. What would you say to that? Of course you're right. 
Thank you. I don't believe that, though. <laughs> and, I don't th and the truth is, your Pew study that you quoted said that over 70% of Jews, both Jews who define themselves as Jews by religion and Jews by culture, over 70% have given their children no Jewish education, either a day school education or a different education. That's where it starts. If you want to talk about the campus, I'm at Yeshiva University and not at Hillel, because I very much believed in Hillel for the 90% of the Jews who were not Orthodox, who I felt by that time, a minority of them felt positive about their Jewishness and we had to empower them, and a majority felt completely disconnected, undereducated, under-celebrated, under-experienced, and I thought not you bring them into a central place, but you put Velcro strips of Jewishness out there, and in terms of Israel, not ask them to get on the barricades of defense of an Israel that they don't even know, but get their bodies on that plane to Israel, and thousands went for the most profound Jewish reason. It was free. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And I want to tell you... Wait, 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 so why, so why I, am I, I paying so much money for tuition for my kids at Yeshiva University? Because you why know... Why isn't it free? First of all, for you, I think it's almost free. Um, <laughs> you, from your mouth to God's ears, amen. Yes. God should be listening more. That, that, that reason that there's a yeshiva university, and I'm going to admit to, uh, to, to acknowledge to you that we have responsibilities for all Jews, but the reason that there's a yeshiva university is that the, the culture of assimilation, the culture of, uh, of a society that's loving us to death, and it's nowhere more visible than in the campus. It's not venal, it's loving. And it's saying, I as an individual am the most important thing in the world. If it feels good, let's do it. We don't have responsibilities, we have rights and entitlements. Um, there, there are no truths, there are just your truth and my truth. Any orthodoxy is suspect. That's a hard place to be a Jew, a serious Jew. It's just a hard place. It's not intentional. It's that more and more our Jewish values are counterintuitive. In a free society, we're increasingly the only thing we believe in is shopping. And I would tell you that in a place like Yeshiva University, although it's a miyot, it's a 10% of our population, if we take the Orthodox and say, don't go running into gilded ghettos. Don't think that you're preserving the Torah for some future generation. Don't think that your progenitor is Noah, so you're, therefore you're going to take Mrs. Noah, the kids, and the family pet into the ark while the rest of the world gets destroyed, but that we think that our forebears are Avraham and Sarah and we're supposed to go into a tent and go out there. So you need to be in a place where you're surrounded by your community, where if you have to learn college-level political science, you also have to learn college-level Tanakh, that you have to be together as thousands strong and recognize that our role is to be the tribe of Levi, is to be the singers of Israel and the teachers of Israel and the leaders of Israel, not to make the world from. Not to make the way, it's not going to work. There are more people leaving from Kite than are being converted by all the outreach that everybody's talking about. But to be a force in the world and in the Jewish world, never giving up and, and, and realizing what I've come to realize as a president of a university, dealing with all the challenges that American universities have and more than that that Yeshiva University has. You know what I learned, Shmoli, after 10 years as president? God rules the world. I can do my part to partner with God, but ultimately God rules the world. So it's not for us to fix it all, but it's us to be out there. I want all you guys to bear witness that the president of Yeshiva University just said that before becoming president, he did not know that God ruled the world. I thought she did. <laughs> Okay, I want to do a, a quick summary because I, I, I want to keep our conversation focused. We're talking about will Jews exist, existential threats to the Jewish people. There seem to be a lot. There seem to be a consensus on the part of uh, Sheldon and, and, and Brett that Iran poses an existential threat, that they, have a, that they will create a bomb, that Brett believes no, that they, they might. That they might, that they, but that they could use it, and if not, it's still going to change their global geopolitical position because they possess it. Sheldon said we're negotiating out of weakness and we'll be ineffective. And then we started talking about assimilation. And Richard, you seem to be saying that the only way to, to reverse these awful numbers that we saw is education, education, that's the main thing. And that 
but you don't believe in, in, in ghettoized Judaism, that you're teaching people here at yeshiva so that they have that bastion of Jewishness, which is more than just the Velcro edition, so that they go out with something substantial, something internalized, and they can bring it to a wider group. Not to make them orthodox, you said, but to give them Jewishness. Now, Sheldon, there are a few people, uh, and this isn't an attempt to flatter you, it's to really, it's to, actually, it's to humble you. It's to give you a sense of responsibility that I'm sure you already know you bear, that few people in Jewish history, certainly in modern Jewish history, have had the power to reshape the Jewish people in their lifetime like you. There has not been a Jewish philanthropist who bestrides the Jewish world as a colossus the way you do since the Rothschild family or maybe Moses Montefiore. It just hasn't existed. There have been other Jewish philanthropists. There have been people who supported this and that, but there hasn't been someone who has so dominated the field becoming one of the 10 or so odd richest men in the world, thank God, and I hope you continue to prosper. It's better than a poke in the eye with a sharp stick. <laughs> okay. Keep going, Shmuel. I, I, I don't disagree with, disagree with that. So you have the power to, to reshape and remold the Jewish people. These numbers are terrible. Where are you going to devote your resources? Okay. Is, 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 is Richard right? Is that all education? You're putting a fortune into birthright. Ten days in Israel is amazing. Is that the solution? Were you out of the room? I didn't say it was all education. I said it was all a home. Okay, but you said Jewish day schools? I, I said you've got to do something to strengthen the entire Jewish community. A Las Vegas Jewish campus strengthens not only the students who are sitting in the school, but the families around them. President Joel, you're a panelist. I am the moderator. I'm, it's, it's fine, I it's fine. But you're the host, I, I, I take own orders. I this microphone. I agree, I agree. I agree, I, I, I humbly submit. Okay, so the home like and President education. like President Reagan said, I paid for that microphone. <laughs> That's it. Sheldon, uh, well, do you want to reverse these numbers and how are you going to do it? I, I want to address them both. First of all, I, I agree with Professor Joel and I agree with Rabbi Shmueli Bodea. You're both right. There was a demarcating line between what he's talking about and what you're talking about. When the kids are under the parents' umbrella to live, they're becoming mature young people. But they don't really mature until they pass the line of going away to college, and they become different people. You know, when we talk about birthright, I recommend to kids, to parents that are going to send their kids, to wait a year, a year and a half. Because once the kids get out from under that umbrella, they have to pick up their own clothes Wash on the them. floor. Wash them. They got to clean them sometimes. They <laughs> they got they got to clean their own sheets. They got to they got to press and launder their own clothes. They start to mature, in other words. So they're in a different environment. The environment that he's talking about, I I believe in it. But once you get out of there and you start interacting with other kids your own age, where you think you're becoming an adult. It's your own mindset that you are becoming an adult because now you're in college and you're no longer in, in middle school or high school. So he's right up until that demarcating line. You're right after that. First of all, I want you to know that I heard I would like to sound the trumpet of the cavalry coming over the hill. We have formed an organization for which I saw the first week's reaction called RethinkIsrael.org. I would like to encourage all of you to, those of you that are more computer literate than I am, you know how to turn it on and off because you don't want to use up all the electricity when you're not using it. Uh, you turn it on and you, I don't know how to do it, but you just go to RethinkIsrael.org. And what is the purpose of it? It's an NGO Hasbara. The Israeli government cannot pat itself on the back and be considered, consider itself cool, credible, worthy of listening to, worthy of creating a following. We have an NGO Hasbara. We're gonna provide information, propaganda if you will, and give you an example of a couple of the items. Israel has passed a law to outlaw thin models, 
female fashion models. Can you imagine that? We want to tell college students, and we're starting off with the target audience of 18 to 24, and we started just five days ago. And uh, we have, Mary and I have well financed this. We intend to make it be the equivalent of a non-governmental organization, Hasbara organization. We also say that we're cool. <coughs> the beaches are cool. The clubs are cool. There are other things like, uh, like uh, did you know there are more uh, museums per capita in Israel than any other place for those people that care about culture and art than any other country in the world. Uh, did you know there's a television program that dogs watch? It's a doggy TV program. Is it and an, is and it they're, he, they're Hebrew, stuck with it. Hebrew or Arabic? Uh, I think. Or is it, it in Bark? Probably it's, it's in Bark. In Bark. Uh, <laughs> it's in Bark. Since my wife and I have four, <laughs> four dogs, uh, we have four dogs. I think we'll start showing, we'll import the TV program so the dogs can watch it. Like our, grand, our grandson watches the, the, uh, the alphabet programs in Hebrew and in English on his iPad, which he knows how to operate better than I do. So the cavalry is coming over the hill to save the day. This NGO Hasbara organization is going to make Israel cool. And we are, we are hoping to diminish the reluctance of both Jewish and non-Jewish college students to look at Israel in a different way. That's why, hence the name, Rethink Israel. The second thing is I want to mention for what the professor said is um, the Pew Research Report. I found good news in that report, and I found bad news. The good news is that the birthright experience was the, the conclusions of birthright were exactly identical to the Pew Research Report. The 42% and the 58%. 42% of young Jewish kids between 18 and 26 say they intend to marry within the religion and or bring their children up Jewish. That's good because I've been pitching that for the last several years in which Mary and I have been involved with birthright since 07. The bad news is that it's 42 and 58%. The same thing. Two more generations, maybe three, there won't be any secular Jews left. There won't be any need for federations, no need for synagogues, no need for Jewish community centers, no need for Jewish family services agencies, no, for, no need for anything. Jewish won't be here. The one thing that Jews have been striving for for thousands of years Acceptance as a first-class citizen to be assimilated into the society and let go out of the jail of the pale of settlement. We finally got it, and it's turning out to be our undoing. If we don't do something about it, there won't be any Jews left. And I said this last night, so Ken you'll hear the same thing. My name is Adelson. My father always said that unlike many people who showed up at the, uh, at, at the uh, Ellis, Island. Ellis Island, I was gonna say Governor's Island, which is where I was stationed when I was in the Army. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, they said their name and then the, the clerk misinterpreted and had another name. He said, Adelson means in German, noble son. I was thinking about the word nobility off and on, and I said to myself, we Jews don't have any monarchs, except we Jewish husbands that have Jewish wives. But exclus exclusive of that, <laughs> what'd you say? I didn't hear. Ex Vice versa. 
vice versa. Oh, really? You must be Chinese. <laughs> uh, the Asians have the practice that the man, that's why we, if, I, if there is a second life, I'm coming back as Chinese because they are the boss in the household. <laughs> uh, I forgot what I was saying. <laughs> the, uh, you were thinking about the name Adelson, Noble Son. Oh, the, uh, the, the Noble Son. While I was uh, talking to a group up in Toronto about uh, noble, about, uh, about birthright, the word noble and nobility came to my mind. And I said to myself, we Jews don't have any monarch to put swords on our shoulders and, uh, and just crown us as, as whatever, as lords, sirs, duchesses. Uh, but because nobility is not granted to you. Nobility comes from your heart. And I have concluded, and I think my wife agrees with me, <laughs> no, no, the word is yes, boss. Don't push it. <laughs> no, I'm telling her what I have to say to her. Um, huh? I concluded that the most noble thing a Jew can do is to be a mason. You know, that you mix mortar and you cut stone to mix the mortar that connects one generation of Jews to the next. Without that, we don't have any Jews. So that's why birthright is so important. I believe in what you said, I believe in what he said, because there is a separating line. I think he said that he agreed with me first, Absolutely. Yeah. No, 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 I said him first. Well, let me, let me just stand this for, ju for just a moment. You're both right. It makes no difference. But Sheldon, for you to tell me that you saw good news and bad news uh, in that... The Pew in, in the Pew study. You know the famous st story, the guy gets a call from his doctor, sit down, because I have bad news and worse news. What's the bad news? I, test results are back. You have 24 hours left to live. What's the worst news? I've been trying to call you since yesterday. Um, <laughs> I mean, Sheldon, you just said that when the gates of the ghetto opened and Jews were allowed to participate fully in, in mainstream society, they opted out. They chose not to be affiliated. That freedom has been a curse to us in terms of um, Jewish identity because when, they, when the non-Jews hated our guts and didn't let us marry their daughters and locked us literally in the, in the Venice ghetto, you see the bolts, they would lock them in at night. You had no choice but to remain Jewish. That's why Spinoza said that anti-Semitism was essential to Jewish identity. Sach, the existentialist, said the exact same thing. So are you really saying that assimilation is being caused by American freedoms? I don't, I don't understand that. Assimilation is being caused by American freedoms? The decisions to, for the life that a person is going to leave is not made in high school. It's made further on in life. When they have more exposure, they mature on their own. And then they're in a position to make better decisions. That's why I'm saying I agree with you. It occurs on the campus. Right. It happens a lot of later. Okay. And part of it is this that open society. And so the question is, what do we do to instill Jewishness with people what? so that they choose Jewish even though they have options to choose something else? Well, birthright has been such a proven commodity. In instilling Jewish identity. In instilling Jewish identity. Whether or not they light candles every Friday night, whether or not they're Shomer Shabbat, and uh, uh, it does create Jewish identity. The challenge we have to, we have to keep that going. But you also said that you don't see any future of the community that isn't Orthodox, meaning that the Pew Research study seems to be showing that the Orthodox is going to survive. I'm an Orthodox Jew. I hope that's not true. We don't want to see only Orthodox survive. We want every Jew to be unless something is done about it. Okay. So the question the question I wanted to ask, therefore, to all of the panelists in a moment is. Um, I say in a moment because I want to put something to bread, but can there be Jewish identity without Jewish religion? You said maybe without Shabbos candles, without, can there be Jewish identity without the Jewish religion is the main question. Or has that experiment been tried and that's what the Pew Research study is showing, that that's a failure. You cannot have Jewish continu continuity without the Jewish religion. Keep that in mind just for a moment, but before that, 
I want to put something to you about what um, Sheldon just said about his new uh, attempt for Hasbara to explain Israel. Brett, you write for the Wall Street Journal, you're a defender of Israel. How is it possible that a dem democracy in the Middle East, uh, seven million Jewish strong, six million Jewish strong, one and a half million Arab uh, citizens, full citizens, yes, there is uh, uh, Judea and Samaria, uh, the West Bank dispute going on, but how is it possible that that democracy that treats women as absolute equals, that had an, a, a female prime minister, that has Arab MKs, that has an Arab on the Supreme Court, how have the how has Israel's opponents successfully, successfully demonstrated to the world, I mean, uh, fraudulently, but successfully in people's minds, that Israel's the aggressor, that Israel is persecuting people, that Israel's the bad guy. How did we lose that public relations battle? How could that have happened? Well, the short answer is the combination of envy being the most powerful emotion in the world and uh, on the one side, and on the other side, a kind of mysterious and neurotic Jewish guilt that wants to in some ways placate that envy by acknowledging some kind of guilt. This is what explains this Jewish obsession with trying to, quote, atone for this or that Israeli action uh, in its history. I mean, who are the most vociferous critics of, of Israel in the world today? and among the most articulate, I'm sorry to say, are many Jews who are, who are seized with this, uh, with this neurosis. I think it's the only, only thing I can, uh, I, the only way I can describe it. Look, um, I was reflecting on a few things Sheldon was saying about his, um, his new uh, uh, Hasbara effort, which is, I think, impressive and, and, and commendable. But you're never gonna win over Israel's enemies by showing how excellent Israel is or Israel's critics. You're going to enrage Israel's critics by showing them the excellence of the state of Israel. People foam at the mouth. I mean, if Israel were some nothing country in the middle of nowhere, no one would give a damn about Israel, okay? It's Israel's success which, it, it, which inspires this fanatical hatred that these people, the most despised people in the world, the most despised people in the shtetls of Europe or, or if throughout the, uh, the Arab or, or, or Muslim Middle East, that they should have risen the way they have and succeeded the way they have. We are not going to win a Hasbara battle against our adversaries. This is where we're going to win a Hasbara battle, by winning over our potential friends. First within the Jewish community, but beyond the Jewish community. Just a brief story. The enemies are lost. Of course the enemies are the lost. Enemies. I mean, you know, what, what can you say? Oh, we win all these Nobel Prizes. We cure polio. Uh, we're really sorry about the West Bank situation. Uh, you know, uh, um, this is, this is, you know, Jews will not win with conspicuous displays of Woody Allen-esque existential anxiety. Um, but, but, this is what we can do. I'll do a quick story. Some people have heard me tell the story before, but it made such an indelible impression on me. I went to go give a speech at some synagogue in Cleveland, and uh, there's a typical synagogue crowd, middle-aged, older Jews, and then there's this one young Chinese woman. She comes up, introduces herself. She's from Shanghai. I said, well, well you know, what do you do? She said she was an MBA student at Case Western, I think, and I said, oh, so what, what brings you here? other than shopping for Jewish husband. Uh, um, and uh, she said, this was her answer, I'll never forget. She said, ah, we Chinese people know, Jews are the smartest people in the world. And I was like, oh, come on. I mean, you know, there are lots of smart people, <laughs> lots of smart Chinese people, you know, the smart people everywhere. And she looked at me and she said, no, Jews, smartest people in the world. And then. I can swear, I mean, I might, this might be an invention of memory, but I think she literally poked her finger in my chest and she said, Jewish people, Nobel Prize in physics, 36%. Nobel Prize in economics, 58%. It was some, I forgot the figures, but they're just sort of mind boggling and, and astonishing. And she was saying something quite interesting. She was telling me that, and she said, by the way, this is something all Chinese people, she claimed, no. Now, I don't know if that's true or not, okay? This is just an anecdote, okay? But what she was saying is, this is a commonly held belief among, oh, 1.3 billion people in this rising country. 
What are we doing to win over Chinese to think, hey, Israel, Jews, terrific people, be our friends? We are doing basically nothing, okay? Maybe there's a synagogue, Kaifeng Jews, Shanghai Revival, basically zilch. So what should we do? Okay, we should be reaching out not to the campuses at Columbia and saying, oh, you know, we're not as obnoxious as you think, not to our enemies. We should be going to places where we can find potential friends, where it's, whether it's in Beijing or New Delhi or flyover country America in Nebraska, where people, where, people aren't arriving, where people aren't arriving on campus with these prejudices about how Israel is this apartheid colonial oppressor state etc cetera, etc cetera. that's the strategy forget the enemies win over the people who are inclined to be your friends i would make one small point now on assimilation which is related to the philanthropic issue and it's this okay is judaism an open enrollment university because city college tried that in the 60s and that 70s and it, its reputation plummeted no we happen to be an elite university so to some extent this anxiety about declining numbers is misplaced you asked about Jews and religion and identity. So long as there's Israel, okay, super secular Jews like me will have a locus of pride and affinity. And that's one of the reasons why Israel is so important to the rest of the Jewish assimilating world. But the point I want to make is this. Where we need to be sure we are doing our utmost is ensuring Jewish excellence, not Jewish numbers. Okay, numbers and excellence are very different things. I mean, one of the most concerning pieces of news, you, you talked about the Pew survey. I don't care about the Pew survey. What I care about is that two Israelis won the Nobel Prize just a couple weeks ago, and where are they? They're at Stanford and at USC. How do you make sure that those Israelis and the brightest Jewish minds in, this, in chemistry, in physics, in medicine, are finding Israel the best place to forge their careers and make their reputations and win their Nobel Prizes. I think that's really the challenge, making sure that whatever the numbers are, the Jewish people are always associated with the best in the world. So, so the stem, the Israeli brain drain. Okay. Well, well, Richard, as I turn to you, let me just uh, dispute some of the points that Brett made, and I'd like to hear your opinion on this. First of all, I disagree with you, Brett. To give up on the universities, to give up on Columbia, to give up on Harvard, to assume that, that, that these elite places of academics that produce the world's op-ed writers like yourself, you went to the University of Chicago, that produce the world's, the world's authors and the world's broadcasters, to give up on them. By the way, that's not the model that we chose at Oxford. At Oxford, the model we chose was we were going to fight back, that we could win arguments in the marketplace of ideas, that we needed articulate spokespeople. Cory Booker just won a Senate seat last week. He's one of the best friends that Israel has now that we'll have in the United States Senate because at Oxford he discovered an organization that was very pro-Israel but that also was pro-Jewish and he was a non-Jew who became a lover of the Jewish people. We could have more people like that. To give up on the universities, these are the people who are the influencers. You're going to end up losing all the influence. These are the people who sit on your editorial board of the Wall Street Journal. So. Of course we need to reach out to others, but I, mean, I can't imagine you really mean that we're supposed to just write them up. But just before that, I must bring in Professor Joel, uh, uh, Professor oh, Joel here, because at Hillel, wasn't that your model? Did, you didn't give up on the universities. You believed that something could be done to fight for Israel. And can we have a Jewish identity without a Jewish religion? At Hillel, were you trying to get people to keep basic mitzvot as well? Or was it Jewish culture you were trying to promote? You can't have a Jewish identity without a Jewish story. And if you think that by simply saying that Israel is a great bastion, it'll work for this generation and the next one, but not after. The greatness of birthright is not just that it strengthens the Jew's connection to Israel and the Jew's connection to his or her own story, but the great challenge, as yet unfulfilled, is when those young people come back from birthright, we haven't yet figured out how to launch them on their Jewish journey. But I was also very taken when you talked, Sheldon, about, about nobility. Because uh, 10 years ago, I stood on this stage when I was inaugurated as president, and I said that in my mind, the purpose of education is to ennoble and enable. It's not just the transfer of information, which more and more is what happens on American university campuses. It's also instilling in young people a sense of who they are, where they've come from, what their history is, and what their destiny is. 
And history and destiny is not about, God forbid, genes, and it's not about achievements, and it's not about Nobel Prizes. I'm not sure. I know for me it's about religion. I don't think the way we build the future is about religion. It's about our children knowing the Jewish story. And you'll let me tell one story. And I told this to some people who in, in Riverdale last night, and a few of them are here, so you'll forgive me. Years ago, I was giving a lecture um, on Jewish identity in Atlanta, Georgia. And I was using one of the lines that some of us who would go on this routine would do. And in talking to them about Jewish identity, I said, how many people, about 500 people in the room, I said, how many people in this room can tell me the name of Jesus' mother? They kind of nodded like this. I said, and how many people in this room can tell me the name of Moses' mother? And now there was a knowing look. And I went on to talk about how can we possibly keep our story going. I said, Avram benefited from assimilation. He was welcomed in this community, but he was Ger Vatoshev, right? He was a part of the community and apart from the community. And that's what makes Judaism, as you say, somewhat elite, because you've got to struggle with that. After the lecture, a guy comes over to me and says, Mr. Joel, you were terrific. My name is Schindler. I'm originally from Brooklyn. I said, I'm Joel. I'm originally from Yonkers. He says, you were great. I agree with everything you say, but I need you to know I'm different than all those people. I said, you are? He says, yeah. He says, I know her name. I said, you do? He said, yeah. And he smiled. He said, it's Yoshebel. <laughs> well, it's not Yoshebel, it's Yocheved. But the poor guy had the bad mazel to be speaking to one of the few idiot savants who knows the only time where Moshe's mother's name is mistranslated as Yoshebel. You know where? <laughs> Cecil B. DeMille's The Ten Commandments. He saw the movie, he didn't read the book. <laughs> there is something about, I'm not talking religion, I'm talking about the Jewish story. And it's, it's thank God it happens on college, but they can't go to college thinking that there's nothing because they'll join the nothingness of college. It's about, it's about vibrant Jewish communities. As Orthodox, we have a responsibility to know who we are, but know that we're part of a larger people and that we're part of American society and we need to take a major role, but we also have a responsibility to do what the Adelsons are doing, to look at different aspects of Jewish life and say, how do we push here? How do we push there? How do we push there? And then we get to where bread is. That it's never about the numbers. It's never about the numbers. It's whether there are critical masses with passion and purpose, with nobility to be able to carry our story forward. So we're not just historical, we're a people of destiny. And that's the job. Okay, this is, this is, this is, can, I, can I just, wait, wait a second, this is really getting interesting because I'm getting so angry that I feel like throwing something right now. I have, I, 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 I respectfully, it's, it's not, it's rare that I disagree with Brett and especially with, with President Joel, who's one of the great American uh, Jewish leaders. No, I'm in trouble. Um, but I got, I, I mean, I, I, I really can't believe what I'm hearing. It's not about numbers. The whole reason Israel has no support is that there's, there's two Jews in the whole world. It's not about numbers. St. Paul comes and takes the best ideas of Judaism markets it as a new religion in Christianity. I mean, Sheldon, you're a businessman. Is that smart business to allow all your intellectual property to be taken, turned into a competitor yeah, this that even begins business. to persecute you? Of course it's about numbers. Paul did what we should have done a long time ago. He took the essence of Judaism and he spread it to the world. Why are we elitist? Why are we proud of being elitist? There are not enough Jews in the world. The numbers are frightening. And Brett, to say that Israel is going to be enough of a locus of connection for secular Jews, that has been disproven already. We've now seen that I'm a Zionist, but I'm a Zionist that knows that Judaism is the essence of our love for Israel. Because secular Zionism is largely regarded as having failed. One and a half million Israelis have left Israel already. Today, 60% of the officer corps in the IDF is religious with the yarmulke. And you see religious Zionism becoming some of the... And, 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 and I put it to Sheldon now, if you're the guy who's going to make a lot of these decisions because you have the resources to implement them, and I don't mean to cut anyone off, well, I want to make this a discussion, do you really think that we're going to have a Judaism, do you really think that we're going to have a Judaism without, Jewish, without the Jewish religion? Is Jewish culture going to do it? Because I read the Pew Research study, Sheldon, as, a, as the failure of Jewish culture to keep Jews Jewish. It failed. I, when I refer to the loss of Jewish people, 
I don't call it the loss of Judaism. I call it the loss of Jewish life. Right. You have a religious life if you have, like Mary and I have, we have two teenage kids. Of course, we have older kids. Uh, these are ours. We have his, hers, and ours children. Uh, every Friday night, we have Shabbat dinner. Mary lights the candles every, every Friday night. We celebrate the holidays. And would you call me an Orthodox Jew? Not by any stretch of the imagination. But uh, we go to, say, Yisker. We go to, uh, uh, we go to the high holidays. We celebrate Passover, Hanukkah, uh, whether it's in one of our homes, and whether in Israel, a home in Tel Aviv, or a home where we live in, in Las Vegas. I want to get to what, uh, to what Brett said, but I'll be very short about it. He said, well, Hasbara is not going to solve all the problems. And Joel, maybe Joel said that. Richard. Uh, Richard. Richard, sorry. sorry. Joel, whatever you want. That's the curse. <laughs> I'm Joel now. That's the curse of having two first names. <laughs> that's the curse of having two first, two first names. names. My right. middle name is Schwartz. <laughs> <laughs> Change it to Schwartz. <laughs> or Goldberg. <laughs> Goldberg. <laughs> Hasbara's not going to work, and my cavalry coming over the hill really isn't any cavalry. But with my lifetime experience, I think it's very difficult to try to convince somebody when they think, if I'm trying to convince somebody of something, when they think I'm such a bad guy, I have no right to do that. I occupy somebody else's territory. I torture them. And according to Hanan Aswari, we poison their children. And uh, I do all these bad things, and we live in a, we create apartheid. So you can't really get very far when somebody thinks all these bad things of you. It's, I think, one of the things, and why I feel that this was a worthwhile effort to support, not only support, to be, but be part of, is because I don't know what the, what the uh, word is, the conjecture is today, uh, as the opposite of cool. Today, everything in the young kids is cool or not cool? I don't know, what, what's the not cool word? Uncool. Lame. Uncool. Okay, uncool. That's Today, good. they call it sick, right? Oh, that's sick. No, no, you're so dated. Oh, darn. And I thought I was up to date. <laughs> when people think that Israel is a cool place, and I'm not just talking about because they set up a law, it's a humanitarian issue. They don't want female models to be anorexic and get sick and perhaps die. And exploited. So they're passing a law, they've, they've passed a law to say that. We gotta bring people on campus that will go to a rally that's called by the Muslim Students Association and say, and, and, and uh, uh, rail against Israel and the Jewish people. See, they're apartheid. They occupy somebody else's country. They're very bad people, so you can't believe anything they say. It's going to take time, but we're going to chip like Pac-Man. We're going to bite away a piece at a time. And uh, we're, going to, we're going to get to the point where Israel is cool. Not uncool. No. It still leaves the question of and, Jewish, and, though. It, but the point is, as I said earlier, his, he, he's right that the, the Jews have passed this line of uh, separation, and they're entering into a new phase of their life where their, their likes and dislikes are going to be displayed in their own mind, and they're going to choose what to do for the rest of their life. Right. You don't have to go to shul every Saturday no, God forbid. and but be Shemesh Shabbat in order to forbid. say, I'm a Jew. Depends on the I truth. think I'm a Jew, and I'm a proud Jew, and I'm not Shemesh yeah, Shabbat. But you, de but you described your Jewishness in incredibly passionate terms, Sheldon. And if we had all of our children observing their Jewishness and their Jewish passion like you did so the numbers wouldn't be shrinking. Right. right? But it's more, it's more than just Israel. Your birthright connection is that Israel triggers something more, correct? Yes. So, so when you're dealing fair. with campus, with respect, you have to deal with more than just the Hasbara of Israel. And in fact, by the way, let me just finish. In fact, there are a lot of kids who aren't anti-Israel but don't know a blessed thing who don't want to get involved. So just as you must do, I mean, I applaud what you're doing, but I think there are other aspects on campus of showing Jewishness as something noble, 
to use, a, uh, uh, to use an Adelsonian uh, statement, um, uh, to something noble is also important. And I also think that you need those who are looking passionately at their Jewishness, who come to Yeshiva University, to know that they better the heck not stay only in Yeshiva University and in the communities of Yeshiva University and not try to go to non-religious people and make them religious, but to go and serve the community and to work for you and to work for these programs and be role models of yashras, of being upstanding, of being upstanding and of representing values. And let the rest of the Jews, I care about numbers, but I'm saying it's not just the numbers game. Let the rest of the Jews look at models like Miriam and Sheldon Adelson and like my thousands of alumni and say, boy, this is something noble. I want to be part of that. Well, the, well, the word, well, I, the word I, I, then is observant. It's not orthodox, it's observant. You observe observant. certain things. You're not fully orthodox, but you said, you have hey, Friday night dinners, you believe in saying Yisko, you go to synagogue sometimes, um, you did your bar mitzvahs of your, of your teenage sons, both at the Kotel. Right. Miri last night spoke uh, about the Torah values that the two of you share, even if, even if you're not fully observant. It's about being observant. I just don't think that Jewish culture is a substitute for the Jewish religion, and that that's what the Pew Research Study really showed. That boiled flanken and, uh, and borscht and uh, klezmer music. Not borscht. And, uh, you know, and klezmer. We Jews, have, we Jews have rejected Jewish culture. We eat sushi now. We prefer Bach and Beethoven probably to Klezmer, or uh, that's if you're older and more sophisticated. And if you're younger, you want, I don't know, Beyonce. We've rejected Jewish culture. It's the Jewish religion that we're trying to hold on to because that gives us a sense of identity. And here's where I turn back to you, Brett. I mean, do you really believe that Israel alone, without that Jewish identity, is going to be enough for secular Jews? And do you really think that we don't need larger Jewish numbers, that we could end up, I mean, at the time of the Romans, there were a million Jews. We can, we, we can shrink to that size, but I think numbers are extremely important. And by the way, I applaud time your column. There were not a million, there were 10 million. In the time of the Romans? Yes. I, I thought by the end of the, of the destruction of the Second Temple, there were a million left. I may be wrong. I, I can't relate it to the time of the destruction of the Second Temple. But I do know there yeah, were 10 in, in million the height Jews of the Roman Empire. At, yes. the time, at the time of Christ. And by the way, we may not be doing 100% of right things, but I don't know any alternatives. This is like democracy. It may not be the best system that God can create, it's the worst system but it's the only one that we got. That's it. So Jewishness, the way we have it today, is the only one we got. I don't know of any alternatives. Everybody likes to criticize, you know, politicians' race. They say, why do you want to vote for that incumbent over there? He does this, he doesn't do that. Why don't you vote me? I'll do everything that you like. But when he gets in the hot seat, they become either the prime minister or the president. They get to make decisions. With all the pressures, things change. Is that your answer, Brett? I put Brett on the hot seat. Uh, well, By the way, I want to applaud your column about, about Israel academics. He wrote a brilliant column in the Wall Street Journal lamenting the fact that Israel has a brain drain, le le losing all these Nobel Prize winners to other universities. Um, well, and that's something that we should be thinking about how to reverse. That's an important consideration for Israel, that it, be, that it re remains a center and a net importer of human excellence not a net exporter of human excellence. Um, look, numbers, more numbers would be great. Would I be happier with Israel with 50 million Jews as opposed to 6 million Jews? Sure, is that likely to happen? No, it's not likely to happen. Um, is it something that should concern us? Yes, should it be our primary concern? I'm not so sure. Um, you talked a lot about the importance of Jewish values and Jewish observance. The important Jewish value that I observe as a person who is as minimally Jewish as you can be without actually tipping over into Unitarianism um, <laughs> is a sense of loyalty. And I think the distinction here is between those Jews who assimilate but remain loyal and those Jews who assimilate but betray. And there are plenty of Jews in the second category whose names uh, need to be mentioned. When I was at the Jerusalem Post, um, the last speech I gave was at an Orthodox synagogue uh, in Israel, and I said to a very Orthodox community, I said, to me, the Jewish world is like a solar system, and I'm like Pluto. 
I'm orbiting elliptically very far away. But I was no longer a planet, by the way. I know. I'm yeah. not even a person. I'm, I'm not a, a planet simulator. either. Yeah. Um, what is it, a dog? Uh, yeah, they, they, ca they call it something else now. A planetoid. It's, it's a planetoid. Planet planet. at, at any rate, but the point is, I'm in the orbit. Right. And I'm held in that orbit right. by a sense that there are these orthodox people who really do observe and do go more than the nine yards, and they they are a source of gravitational attraction for me, so that maybe my kids will be a tiny bit more observant uh, than, than, than I am. Um, and then there is Israel, which reminds me that there is a center of Jewish life and Jewish excellence and Jewish pride and sovereignty, and that is that gravitational pull for me. That is, I think, how we remain a vibrant Jewish community that understands that the satellites have to respect the sun and, and, and vice versa, to take this astronomical metaphor beyond uh, its, its, uh, uh, its limits. That's, I think, what, what you need to do. But it's important. Who, who's the sun in this model? The sun is ultimately Israel. I mean, there are two suns. OK, look. <laughs> it's a strange, it's a different universe. There are two suns. There's Israel. There's the Jewish religion. Whatever. There's a center of gravity, OK? okay. Um, <laughs> to which the rest of the, the semi-assimilated or mostly secular Jewish world ought to, ought to maintain um, a, some kind of relationship, some kind of sense of loyalty. And, that's, and by the way, it makes for a richer Jewish life. You know, when a Jew wins the Nobel Prize, we say, oh, a Jew won the Nobel Prize, right? We don't say, well, you know, he's not particularly observant, right? You know, gee, I mean, uh, I haven't seen him in shul for 30 years, right? <laughs> What we want is to create Jews who, at some level, say, wake up in the morning, and maybe in some stray thought as they're shaving or doing whatever, they say, you know, I'm a Jew, and that's fantastic. And that is fantastic. Well, you know, you know, at, at, at Hillel, when we were trying to figure out what kind of possible outcome? What are the metrics and the measures? I mean, it's something of a business. What's success? So it's an inelegant term, but you just reminded me of it. For me, it was if Jewish kids walk off of campus and say, this Jewish thing means something to me, then we won. As long as in the rest of the Jewish community, there are opportunities for them to connect with Jewishness. So I actually agree with you, I'm sorry to say. Don't say actually. Don't well, no, rise. because I didn't know there were two sons. <laughs> and I'm president of a university, and you don't want me to say that. Oh, by the way, can I say one more Wait, thing? Sheldon, Sheldon, Sheldon has a dispute with you but, about but just, something. Just one thing, okay, about, Shmuel, you know, you, you were Shmuel. talking about uh, uh, oh, Harvard and the importance of, the, of, of being vibrant and, and, and uh, present on, on so-called elite campuses. You know, my mother made a very wise remark after I won the, won, won the Pulitzer. She said, oh, that's nice. That way stupid, this way stupid people will know you're smart. And essentially, going to school like Harvard is the way stupid people you know you're smart, right? You can say, oh, I went to Harvard. I mean, you can be picking your nose, but you think, oh, <laughs> I went to Harvard, right? There are lots of elites, okay, or lots of people who will become the elite who are not currently enrolled in one of the top ten universities, so-called top ten universities in America. Oh, I agree the with the that. elite is being created at some distant point in the future, and it's not being recognized by where U.S. News and World Report places your university, or even when a Pulitzer committee hands you, hands you a, a Tiffany crystal, okay? That's not, the, that's not the signal of excellence. I agree, but all I'm saying yeah. is, at Oxford, we saw this, the anti-Israel movement begin in 1988. I guess because Arafat was then mainstreamed, he had recognized Israel. Suddenly, the Oxford Union was inviting pro-Palestinian speakers. And our response was that we could really win this. We, they brought their, they brought Khanan Ashrari. She started make, cutting her teeth at Oxford debates. We felt that we could engage those debates and win arguments in the marketplace of ideas. And people like Juan Dermer, who are our students, who just became Israel's ambassador to the United States, they gained their first real skills in fighting Israel's battles in those debates at Oxford. I don't care if, it, if it's Dade County Community College near where I grew up in Miami, or if it's Oxford University. The, you have to engage and believe you can win. I don't want to write these people off. That's my main point. But Sheldon, you want to make a point. We're coming to the end in, 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 a, in a moment, ladies and gentlemen. Sheldon. I, I think he made a point that the scientists are going back to Israel to achieve their scientific, to write at their, up to the scientific pinnacle. It's just the opposite. Mary and I have a, a uh, 
not very well known, but very effective uh, medical research foundation. I've created a, we've created a, a uh, collaborative way of conducting medical research that has fundamentally changed the way medical research is conducted. Not according to us, according to the scientists. We support, at our peak, we supported 200 scientists in 70 different institutions. In Israel? No, all over the world. Uh, but we have we have maybe six or eight in Israel, Weizmann, Technion, Hadassah. Uh, we study uh, six or seven cancers, uh, a couple of neurological issues. Uh, we don't publicize it very much, but we we laid back uh, during the recession, and now we've the last couple of years we picked it up again. In the last uh, three years, we have published 445 scientific papers. Collect collaboratively. So I want to tell you, this was a big subject. We, we about quarterly, we bring 1,500 scientists in, and we just had a, had a group of scientists in a couple of weeks ago. These are the tops of the top. In all the cancers, one of our scientists who runs a cancer program discovered Herceptin, the, the medication that uh, treats 25% of women with breast cancer. But anyway, what I want to tell you is here's the reason why we can't keep scientists in Israel. And we had a lot of scientists in Israel talking about it there. The reason is there's no such thing as the NIH over there. The National Institutes of Health, that is a government funded, they fund about 30 billion in doing their own research. This is like the United States Hospital and the United States Research Group. Uh, we even financed some of the, some of the programs at, uh, at the NIH, and the NCI, the National Cancer Institute. Uh, the problem is there's no NIH there. So people who want to study can't get grants. They can't get grants, so they come over to the states where they can get grants. So the magnetism is pulling in this direction, not going in the Israeli direction. That's the reason why they're not there. Got to do a column about that. Okay. I could put you in touch with one or two Nobel Prize winners. One of them is somebody we support up, up at Technion. Nobel Prize winner. Uh, they just don't have the money to support the scientists. Yeah. So these, uh, these guys that are walking brains with MDs, PhDs, or multiple PhDs, uh, they just can't, they can't, they don't get money to conduct their research in Israel, so they have to come to where the money is. This is like, uh, who's that bank robber? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Why uh, do you rob banks? Who? That's where the money is. Uh, yeah, Willie Sutton. Why, yeah. Do you, why do you rob banks? Well, that's, that's where, the money, where the money is. So why do they move to the States? Because that's where the money is. Okay. Um, we started by discussing the existential threat to Israel from Iran. Well, every life has a body and a soul, so we discussed the, ex the existential threat to the body. Then we went to the soul assimilation. And I want to put the last question to each of the panelists, giving short responses, please, back to the existential threat so that we close the circle. Prime Minister Netanyahu will be in Rome tomorrow for meetings with John Kerry. Um, it is widely believed that President Obama would like to see a peace deal before he leaves office. Uh, he has stated as much. Um, he won a Nobel Peace Prize already. Many people feel he feels he has to earn the Nobel Peace Prize. What better way than Israel? I mean, that's perhaps my interpretation and that of others on it. But there could be a lot of pressure on Israel to cede land for peace. And I was, I just spent the last three days visiting communities in Judea, Samaria. I met widows of the IDF, a very moving trip. Anyway, I was sending you some of the pictures of the women that I was meeting who lost their husbands fighting gallantly for Israel in places like Gaza. So to each of the, of the participants, given that Israel is probably going to face a lot of pressure to cede land for peace, uh, and let me begin with you, Brett, and then go to Sheldon, and then go to Richard. Uh, you originally supported the Gaza withdrawal, but you later repudiated that support, which was a very brave thing for someone to do, to actually repudiate his own position. I, I've rarely seen that in print. Should Israel trade land for peace? Should Bibi succumbed to undoubtedly a lot of pressure that's going to come his way. 
Well, right. I mean, when you take, stake a position and it's demonstrated to be wrong, you yeah. should recant the position. Look, the, be, the, the most that I can Why say... Why were you wrong on Gaza? Well, the most that I can say is that if Gaza was supposed to be a test case for what a Palestinian state might look like, it was one hell of a test case. The first thing that happened, it was the destruction of the economic assets that Israel and Jim Wolfenson had strenuous, had, had, worked, had labored to maintain in place so that Gaza might have been a showcase of what a Palestinian state might be. People say, oh, it's so small, it's so crowded. A, it's not crowded. Anyone who's actually been to Gaza, as I have, knows it's not uh, 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 crowded. And B, what's wrong with small? Hong Kong is small, Singapore is small, Macau is small, these places uh, thrive. So what you saw in Gaza was what a Palestinian would, state would look like. First a civil war, then Hamas takeover, an entrepot for, for, for global terror, a threat not just to Israel, but a threat also to its uh, other uh, forgotten neighbor, Egypt, to, uh, uh, to uh, its south, a hotbed for fanaticism, a place where women are repressed, can't run in marathons because they might, you know, they might have to wear uh, uh, running shorts, and so on. So you have to sort of accept the evidence of experience. You know, I've often said I'm in favor of a two-state solution provided the state on the other side of the border is Canada, okay? Is what? Is Canada. Canada. Is Canada. Canada. <laughs> and I mean this very seriously to people who say, oh, you know, pro-Palestinian people, like, I say this and they say, oh, you know, that's ridiculous. And what they're saying is, it's ridiculous to expect that Palestinians should be expected to behave like Canadians. That is, peaceable, funny accents, uh, uh, odd sporting habits, but basically, you know, good people, right? And they say, oh, that's horrible. How can you say that? No, it's horrible of the so-called pro-Palestinians to just write off the Palestinians as, as a people who are totally incapable of liberal, democratic, peaceable, tolerant, pluralistic government. So by all means, I go back to the 1967 lines. If the 1967 lines are the 49th parallel, I have no objection to that. But if all we're doing is midwifing into existence another fanatical, failed, dysfunctional uh, state committed not to building up its own institutions, but committed entirely to the destruction of its neighbors, plural, Jordan, Egypt, as well as Israel, then it's, I think it's an insanity to support this kind of state. Let's, 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 let's do the Palestinians the honor of saying, we expect the international community knows that there are Kurds who wish they had a state, and there are Tamils who wish they had a state, and there are Tibetans who wish they had a state. There are many stateless people, okay? And the world being what it is, we expect you to demonstrate your worthiness and your readiness to have a state, because you know what? When you look at all the post-colonial experiments from 1947 onwards, there's about one success story. One state that emerged as a little third world country with few natural resources and ended up being this wildly successful first world country, that's Israel. Let's do... Let's say to the Palestinians, let's say to the Palestinians, we look forward to when, to where your faculty produces more than so-called engineers uh, who are experts in explosives. Show us what you can produce in terms of agriculture, in terms of genuine human rights, in terms of theater, the arts, respect for culture, respect for antiquities. And by the way, am I saying anything outrageous? I'm not. But there are people who, there are a few people in this audience who are going, oh my God, you know, it's outrageous. You know, no, people are not born with a natural, immediate right to self-determination. They have to demonstrate that right. That is the, that is, that is the reality of, of politics and history. So let us say to the Palestinians, by all means, prove to us you want to earn the right to have a state that will make you as Palestinians and the rest of the world proud. Okay. You said, you said there's people, short answer. No, you said there's people in the audience that, that, that feel that way. You're actually going to see it on some of the websites that are going to follow this discussion, yeah. because some of the people who are here in the audience are very much opposed. They, 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 they 
cover our events, but I insisted, because I believe in freedom of the press, that they be allowed to enter. No doubt, I know what that takes going to be on it, but uh, we believe in freedom of the press. That's the way it should be. I, I believe that Israel and the Jewish people can win arguments in the marketplace of ideas. I, that's what Israel represents. It's an open democracy, and that's what we always practice. Sheldon, should Israel be prepared to um, trade land for peace? <coughs> I think it's as, uh, it's unwise to trade land for peace as it is to trust Rouhani. It's more unwise to trade land for peace from a people who are not a people. You cannot find a serious book covering history that uses the word Palestinian referring to a people prior to, I'll take around, around point in time, the Second World War. The Palestinian people were not created until the PLO was, was created in 1964. There's no such thing as a Palestinian. Do you know what they are? The Palestinians call themselves Southern Syrians. They're the Syrians that were left over from the district of Syria that was so named in the Ottoman Empire. When France was sent in by the League of Nations and Britain was sent in by the League of Nations to break up those areas and, and to uh, demarcate the borders, they put in Syria, the French put in Syria and Lebanon and south of there, the Arabs that lived there, there were, the Syrians, were left over because they lived in Palestine. Now I'm saying Palestine, it was south of, of, uh, of Syria. So they called themselves Southern Syrians. Now I was just given a book last night by a Joan Peters who wrote a book that, that, that cut short my hope to commission a scholarly study about the Southern Syrians and who make up the Arabs? Mark Twain in the 1800s went from Jerusalem to Haifa, and he said he hardly saw anybody except goats and sheep and Bedouin. There's no such thing as a Palestinian people. They have fooled the world very successfully. I don't like Arafat. I don't like what he stands, what he stood for. He, he, stu he stood for the destruction of the Jewish people. Give them a state by which they're gonna say, oh, we're not gonna be de demilitarized and compromise with them. Oh, here's a good compromise, somebody could say. You wanna kill, you say to the, I can imagine a meeting between uh, an Israeli Jew and the Muslims. Muslims, you wanna kill 100% of the Jews. We don't want you to kill anybody, so let's compromise. We'll surrender half of the Jews so you could kill them and then the other half of the Jews will stay alive, and both of us get a compromise. Can't get everything we want, but we get some of what we want. It's ridiculous. These people espouse the destruction of the Jewish people worldwide in the state of Israel. When they talk about the little Satan and the big Satan, this is not colloquy, this is not conjecture. This is, they really mean it. In their culture, in their religion, there's a big difference. Why do you say the, the, the men who become martyrs go to heaven and they meet up with 72 virgins? I can never figure out what the virgins did to deserve that. <laughs> but, but they do distinguish between heaven and hell. Hell to them, they really believe in it. So America is the great Satan because it's a larger country, and Israel is the little Satan. So they get rid of one, they're going after the other. Nobody believes him. Nobody believes Hillel Cook when he came to this country and tried to convince Roosevelt that millions of Jews were being gassed. Nobody believed him. So nobody believes that uh, what, what, what they have in mind. So I, I think um, uh, to go and, and allow a, a Palestinian state is like uh, playing Russian roulette with yourself. 
because one day it's, it's, the bullet's going to come out and it's going to kill you. So I wouldn't consider that. They hate us. They don't want us alive. If, if they really wanted peace, somewhere, somehow, in the last 65 years, they would have moved one millimeter toward the Jewish demands. They're always saying, well, we want, uh, you've got to show a confidence, a confidence building measure. That's a lot of baloney. What, why don't they show confidence building measure? As I said earlier, all you've got to do is not have terrorism for five or 10 years and you convince the Jews you're going to be peaceful. This is not an issue uh, about a grievance. Like the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor because in the Second World War, the United States cut off the flow of oil to Japan to punish them for attacking and taking over China. This is not a territorial issue. The Arabs have 500 times more land than, than Jewish, than, than Israel has. And by the way, the biblical Israel or Palestine was Israel plus Jordan. So I don't understand why, why we're listening to these guys and we feel compelled to say, talk about a two-state solution for what? So you're, okay, so, you're, so you're opposed to land for peace. And finally, Richard. Yeah. How often are you asked this question? How often do I answer it? <laughs> um, first of all, I mean, I think there's been incredibly um, um, cogent comments by, by two esteemed colleagues, but I'll only make two comments. One is, I can't find a place where a country has an obligation to commit suicide. I just, I just I, you know, that's the bottom line. Number two, I'm going to be a little unpopular now in terms of a two-state solution. I think we have passionate discussions among ourselves. I think we need to be supportive of the state of Israel in every way. I think the decisions, ultimately, the decisions about um, uh, negotiations and peace are the proper province of the people who live in the state of Israel. And I think we can talk among ourselves. Um, uh, but uh, until I move there, I want to be supportive of the government of Israel, and I want the government of Israel to direct its own future. Thank you. Well, I have three kids there now, thank God, so I hope that counts for having uh, some say, but, uh, but I agree with you, not nearly as much as anyone who lives there and, and defends the country, etc. cetera. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for participating in this very spirited conversation. Wait, 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 we have, a, we have, we have a vote of thanks from Ken Abramowitz. Ken is a supporter of many of these live events. These live events are critical to fostering a values-based conversation from the perspective of the Jewish people, and Ken will do the vote of thanks. Thank you, Ken. Just give us one moment, please, ladies and gentlemen. And I want to thank the speakers for being very candid uh, and for having a, uh, a free... Someone lost a wedding ring? Did someone lose a wedding ring, really? Mort Klein Mort Klein's wedding wife okay. threw away his wedding okay. ring. Everyone, please, please, please show respect for us to end this uh, event properly with our vote of thanks from Ken Abramowitz, uh, who helps us put on these events. Thank you. Ken, go ahead. Uh, thank you very much, Millie. Um, I just wanted, to, in uh, five minutes, I wanted to mention three quick things. Uh, number one, I want to thank you, Shmuley, for organizing this at very short notice. You're doing a great job. Keep doing it. Um, uh, uh, President Joel, thank you for hosting us here. Very gracious of you. Uh, 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 Sheldon and Miriam, thanks for all that you do for the Jewish people. <laughs> 